Hi, this is um, a video where I'm going to walk through how I would do the Excel work for my analysis plan. Obviously, you need to tailor what you do for your questions, but just to give you an idea of the structure. So um, I'm starting out with my analysis plan open. This is the one that's on the class project share drive. And the first question I have is, um, is the proportion of customers acquired by TV advertising greater in non-college educated versus college educated. Okay, so um, this is part of the um, questions. The two first questions are um, going to be addressed in the full data set. So if we come over to Brightspace, I can go to the assignments tab and in the assignments tab, come down to the task three Excel work. If I click in here, I will see the instructions that are kind of guiding me on what to do. And first thing um, I want to do is get my analysis plan. So that's what I have. The second thing I want to do is I want to go and get a copy of the task to new ARDS data. Um, remember that the um, I told you that they sent us new data because um, there wasn't actually enough trends in the old data. So this new data is in class project test to Excel work. So we wanna go ahead and get a copy of that. So if you open that, um, you don't wanna work in Google Sheets. So what we're gonna do is go in and download a copy as a Microsoft Excel document, okay? And once you do that, um, the next thing we want to do is we're going to um, open that file. It should have four tasks. Are it's full, mills, mills M, and mills F. All right. And um, we are going to save this as. Um, so you can decide how you want to save it. Um, but I do recommend that you put something in it, implying it is, it's um, a task three work. So maybe. Um, Task three, EDA and analysis would maybe be a good name for it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and call it that. And I have to overwrite what I have there, which is fine. Okay, so now um, this is the data I wanna work with. And I want to ask the question, or I wanna set up the hypothesis for question one, so I want to look at the proportion of customers acquired by TV advertising. Um, is that greater in non-college educated versus college? And the first thing that I'm told to do in my analysis plan, remember this is your to-do list. This is why it's really important that what you, whatever you write below your question is thoughtfully, um, what's the word I want to say? It, it is thoughtfully thought through that it is applicable, what's in here is applicable to your question and not just, you just wrote your question and then copied everything I had and it has nothing to do with what you have. So that would just mess you up. So we don't wanna do that. You wanna be fully engaged in this question and thinking about what you have down here and make sure you understand what your own instructions to yourself are. Okay, so the first thing it says is, um, we're gonna provide an empirical distribution table showing the proportion of college and non-college educated customers that were acquired through TV advertising and the corresponding 100% stack bar uh, chart will be provided. Okay, so um, in my art, uh, my Excel file, I'm going to start by um, adding a new worksheet here and I'm gonna rename this worksheet, worksheet um, as question one, EDA for the exploratory data analysis. And so here, I'm just gonna write a little um, introduction that this EDA supports uh, question one of the analysis plan. All right, and since we are writing one complete analysis plan, I don't, I don't need to say it's task three, okay? Because it is the first question in our analysis plan. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy what question one is here. So going back over here, I'm going to just copy this so I have it clearly um, 
visible for anyone who would be opening this Excel file and trying to follow what I was doing. Okay, so now that I have this, um, I see that I am need, need to create a contingency table of sorts. Um, and it is going to have to have the sum of the proportions of the channel acquired um, broken down by college and non-college. Those are my two populations, right? So I can actually see that if I read through um, what's down here, um, it gives me a little guidance. Okay, these are my two populations. So that's what I need the proportions of the channels acquired by. So that means I need, I'm gonna need to put in a pivot table here. So let me go in and I'm going to <clears throat> go ahead and get um, the college or not college. And that's here. And I'm gonna just drag this across until I get the channel because this is the quick and easy way to do it. I don't care if I have extra variables in my pivot table. It doesn't really impact me in any negative way to have more. Sometimes it's a pain if I didn't get enough. So I am running a risk here, but I think it'll be okay. Um, so you could put them all in every time, but right now I'm just gonna say insert pivot table. And then down here, I'm going to put that in an existing worksheet. And I'm gonna identify that location um, is right here. Okay. So now we have our template for a pivot table. And now we have to build it. So I'm going to build it with college and, as my rows because I want college to be my. Um, oh, I messed up, didn't I? OK, I'm going to show you how to fix it. I included all my data instead of doing the rectangle of data. That's why I see blank here. That's OK. Um, let's fix that. So in this is good for you to know anyway. So um, in the pivot table analyze tab, I'm going to go to change source data, change data source. And it popped me over to show me what it thinks I wanted, but now I'm going to change it. So I'm going to go from the upper left corner and I'm going to um, scroll down to the bottom over here on channel is column N. And I'm going to come to the bottom of that. And now I'm going to hold the shift key down while I click on the bottom right corner of the rectangle and I'll say, okay. Right, so now we see that we were able to remove the blanks. And then I have this unknown in here. So I'm going to um, hover until I can get the four pointed arrow and pull that down below the yes. So I have no and yes and unknown. I don't really care about unknown that much um, because my question is talking about TV advertising. Now, there is a possibility that I have already done this in my task two exploratory data analysis, which is where I obtained the information that I needed to enable me to come up with the question. So in some ways I'm kind of repeating this and you don't have to do that. You can actually pull this information into this worksheet from your task two if you have it there. But I'm gonna go ahead and just try to keep everything clean in one worksheet and work in here. Okay, so um, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna find out the channels, the proportions that the channels are. So I'm gonna grab that and I'm gonna pull it down to the values. And then in here, I am going to go to value field settings and I want the proportion that TV are, TV, uh, how many were acquired? So the 10 of the 28, I want to know what proportion that is for the people who did not go to college versus the 38 out of 156 that did go to college. All right, so um, I can say, I want to show value as uh, the percent row total, right? Because I'm, I want the prop proportions for um, the rows. So do that, say, okay. And I don't like the way this is formatted. Um, I'm gonna have to format it again. So I guess for now I'll leave it. Um, one thing though, um, I have not shown you before and it's okay if you don't do this in your tables, but um, you are able if you wanted to, to filter this. So I can go up here to college, click on this drop down arrow 
and just unclick unknown. It's just like the filter tab. So by clicking that, I now have my proportions this way. Now, remember, the pivot table is not what you want to use to um, create any kind of graphs. So I'm going to copy this um, down below. Oops, excuse me. Copy it with paste special. And then now I'm going to format it. So this is going to be channel. And this is going to be college. And this I'm going to get rid of. And then <clears throat> I can start playing around with formatting it a little bit. Again, I don't want to spend tons of time on this in this video. This is something um, you can certainly do on your own. So let me just not, I'm not going to do too, too much formatting. You want to make it look nice and um, professional. So there's a lot more you can do. You can see some of my other videos where I did some more elaborate formatting. The main thing though is I wanted to get this and I, now I want to create a stack bar chart. So I'm going to select the data leaving the grand totals out. And we're going to go to insert. Hopefully by now, this is definitely what you, you know how to do this. Now notice, the default was to put the total, was to use the channels for the different bars. But I don't actually want that. I want to know of the, and that's why the percent total is on the row. So I'm going to need to go up here and switch row and column so that I'm able to get the proportions in this 100% stacked bar chart to match, to add up to 100% in the bars. And I'm just gonna put data labels in here. Oops, not data, table, data labels. There we go. And um, I definitely need to give this a title and I definitely need to give it the um, X axis, the primary horizontal axis. I need to say that this is college. So I am not going to do every single thing I expect you to do. This video is meant to be a guide only. Um, there is still a lot more work that I need to do to clean everything up, format this, whatnot. But I'm just giving you the flavor of what we need to do. So going back to my instructions, I've now completed this. So I'm good there. All right, and so now the next thing is I have to do a two group difference between proportions hypothesis test to answer this question, okay? So in my um, Excel, I'm gonna now add another um, tab and I'm gonna call it Q1. So in this worksheet, we're gonna um, state um, that in this worksheet, uh, a difference of proportions. And again, this is because this is my question one hypothesis test. Yours might be a difference in means, um, or it may be a single group test of means or single group test of proportions. So um, very specific to me, this is just um, an example. You are to do analogous work, not exact work. Very big difference, okay? Uh, will be performed. And what we do here um, is guided by that um, formula, all the hypothesis test formula sheet I handed out. Um, we would um, use that in also the video where I program some of the necessary calculations to do this. Let's go ahead and make sure we have everything in here. So let's go ahead and write what was in the um, analysis plan. Okay, for my question one, I'd like to at least put in what the subpopulation is in here. So I'm gonna try and put this in here. So let me just type in here subpopulations. And actually I can shrink up my window a little so we can have these side by side. And I'm going to, hopefully I can just copy this in here. It seemed like it wants to move it, give me the tabs that are kind of inherent in the formatting. That's okay, I'm gonna just go with it. All right, and then I'm going to put in my parameters. So I define my parameters. These are like, um, everything else will sort of fall in in the rest of the table. 
the rest of the information. And you can view one of my other videos where I run this kind of analysis, uh, hypothesis tests. Okay, so parameters, and then here I'm going to try and see if I can grab this stuff from here. Let's see if it'll let me. Yeah, it didn't really do that very well, did it? Okay. Let's see. What happens if I delete this? Is it going to delete everything? No. Okay. Let's grab this one and move it. Okay. Some of this is Word and Excel are supposed to work together very well. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't work as well as you'd like. So I'm just trying to grab my parameter definitions. So anyone who looks at this Excel kind of can figure out what I'm doing. Um, this is going to get messed up again. It's OK. Let me delete it. This one, there we go. There we go. Oh, I see. It's not messed up. Let me just move that out of the way. Okay, so now that we put those in here, um, I'm going to then kind of make sure I have my conditions for use of this hypothesis test. So we want to make sure we satisfy those. Use, grab those over here. Let's see if I'm able to get this in here. I'm just going to grab the images. Second, I think it's the second image. We just get just the image. I uh, didn't quite do that, did it? Okay, that's fine. Um, and then at this point, you would um, go ahead and keep running as was done in several of the. Well, it was done in one of the videos on hypothesis testing. Okay. So I'm going to stop here on this one. Now, question two. We're going to do a linear regression analysis in here. And um, I want to go ahead and start by adding another worksheet. And I'm going to call this one um, question two EDA. And again, let's go ahead and pull question two in here. I believe we'll put it up like, so I believe that was like here. And let's see, question one, EVA. Uh, let's just copy, keep that, keep kind of that going similar. I'm going to put that in here and change this to question two. Okay. All right. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is figure out our predictors. Now, I told you that the strategy is to do a full model approach. The only problem is we have to be careful to look for any multicollinearity. All right. So we want to be careful that we don't have things that are that are um, extremely um, uh, one variable can be interchanged with another variable. So to do that, we need to um, check for multicollinearity. Um, so we're going to run some regression on the numerical data. So let's go over and look at the arts data. And we may actually need to um, create a new worksheet where we put that data in there. Okay, what we do know from question two is that um, we first need to get this higher satisfaction rating. So I actually need to do this part. So before I can even check for multicollinearity, I need to add a new variable. Now, I'm trying to check everyone's questions. I'm pretty sure no one has to do this. So you can skip right over this part and um, 
In fact, I don't want to confuse anyone, so I'm going to just pause the video and um, jump to where that's already in my data. And um, you can, you know, for you, instead of it being a, a SAT score, it's hopefully one of like spending 2020, spending 2021, maybe it's um, number of orders, something like that. Okay, so for me, I'm going to just pause for a second and take care of that. Okay, so here I'm looking at my art full data and I, used, I created a little lookup table that I used with index match to create these um, set satisfaction scores, um, so category scores. You don't need to do any of that. You're using a numerical response variable. I, like I've told you in class, I wanted to pick something that you would not have picked. So I needed to actually create something because there weren't that many choices. All right, so um, in order to run this, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to create the numerical data that I want to run correlations on. So I'm going to go over to Q2 and let me just go ahead and um, rename this and I'm going to rename this Q2, oops, numerical. So let's get from the ARDS data and maybe now would be actually a kind of a good time to go ahead and get that second window going. Let me save how much what I've done so far. Go to view, pop out a new window and see if I can get these in view to be vertical and side by side. Okay, great. All right, so um, on the left-hand side, I'm going to come back to all the data and I'm going to put my response variable as the very first one. So I'm gonna copy that into this first spot with paste special because I had index match in there. I don't want to change anything. Um, and then now I'm going to get the um, rest of my numerical variables that I would like to put in there. So I'm um, just to make things quicker and easier, I'm probably going to get more than I need and then just delete the ones I don't like. So I see that uh, household size is where it starts being numerical. And um, I uh, am not going to be looking at RFM um, directly. And these binary ones are actually dummy variables and we will treat those differently. So I'm not gonna be looking at correlations with those either. So it looks like the last place I need to go to is age. So I'm going to come over and copy all this over to my data over here and again, paste special, right? And then I'm just gonna get rid of zip code um, and satisfaction and channel. Okay, we'll get rid of all those. Okay, so now we have um, this data here. I'm just gonna pull it over and um, if I want, you don't have to do this. You can center things if you want, and you can also make sure you can read everything. Okay, um, now I'm going to run a correlation, so I'm gonna go to the data analysis tool and click on the correlation. And in my input range is actually gonna be all of this data right here. And I'm going to say, I do have labels and I'm gonna select my output range. So I'm going to go ahead, um, just because sometimes Excel can be funny, I'm gonna place it in the same worksheet where the data is and then I'll make a copy of it and move it. So I'm gonna start out by putting it there. All right, so I created this nice grid for me to run correlations on. All right, so now I'm going to just make a copy of that and move that into my Q2 EDA. So this is where I want to be checking for multicollinearity. All right, so again, um, let's just make this a little more readable. Whoops, we don't need that one that big. Let's pull that one back. Okay, and actually we don't need any of these this big. 
So let's go in here and 16 decimals. I think we don't need more than two decimals on these. <clears throat> so given that, once again, center and get things looking a little better. Okay, so now when I'm looking at possible predictors in my data, I'm looking for anything that could be from a um, generally weak-ish. Um, so you're, you're not super strict here, okay? You're gonna look for things that might be related to satisfaction score because even though they may not look extremely correlated, they may end up being um, significant predictors. So I'm gonna focus in on these three and I see that I also have percent change and the natural log of income here. So the ones that are like negative 0.02, really close to zero, I'm not gonna worry about, okay? Now, for the ones I'm considering as predictors, all right, the first thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do is actually confirm that they are in fact, um, Linear, there's a linear trend, and that is not a nonlinear trend. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my task two because I did a lot of this already. We ran, oh, wait a second. We actually don't have that data, do we? Because um, we didn't have SAT score. You can run them, you can pull the data in directly from your task two. You don't have to recreate everything because everything should have been run. You're not creating any new. Like I had to create stat score. You don't have to do that. You're going to be using one of these, right? That one or that one or that one or that one. So you just have to pull the correlations in from your task two work or my task two work. So I'm going to pause again and just add those in here. And I've done this already in multiple videos. So I'm just going to pause this. Okay. So now I have all my scatter plots and I'm looking at trend lines and I'm just trying to make sure I don't see anything significantly nonlinear. Uh, there is some wiggle in here that I don't love seeing. Like it looks like it kind of comes up down like this and so does this one. But I think it's going to be okay and we're going to assume that this looks fine. So now that I'm feeling it's good enough to keep including those as predictors, um, my next question is, well, do I have any multicollinearity amongst these predictors that I'm going to look at? So um, in spending 2020, um, I want to compare spending 20, that with spending 2021, and that has a, a correlation of 0.2, so that seems okay. And then when I look at income and spending 2020, I see a correlation of 0.25, so that's okay. I don't need to worry about that one. But when I look at income and spending in 2021, I'm seeing a kind of a strong correlation here, 0.77, right? So that makes me concerned. Then the other one, so I'm gonna come down to percent change. And again, I'm gonna read across anything that is highlighted in yellow. So I've got percent change and I'm comparing that with spending 2021. So again, those appear quite collinear. And so it is percent change with income. Okay, so I'm not surprised because if these two are collinear, then you would expect that it would be like a three-way collinearity going on. All right, so then we have the natural log of income and that is also highly correlated um, with income. It's the natural log of income, so we expect that. We're gonna look at it anyway because sometimes it's a little better behaved. Um, than just income, sometimes it's not. Okay, so these are the ones that are in some sense the most problematic. They're in the 0.7 or higher. Also, you wanna look for something that's negatively correlated, a strong negative correlation. So like a negative 0.7 or more negative, like negative 0.8 or something. All right, so this is where we're going to now need to determine what we're gonna do with these. So again, we're gonna to need to create um, the um, scatter plots to consider what's going on here to confirm that it is actually appears to be a 
uh, collinearity. So um, I'm going to, again, pause the video. These, all these different uh, correlations, you may already have some of them. So you would just pull them in from your task two um, EDA work that you did. Um, so I'm actually, I think maybe I won't pause. I'm going to go ahead and work on one of these. So let's see, the first one I'm going to look at is income and spending 2021. So those are right next to each other in my numerical data. So I'm going to select those, insert, scatter plot. And I'm going to copy that. I'm sorry. I'm going to remove it and put it over here. And let's just add that here. And I'll just say um, uh, possible collinearity. Oh, I'm going to just go ahead and make this a little bigger for right now. All right. Um, make this one smaller. And I don't want anyone to believe that my graphs are complete. I'm just giving you an idea of what to do. They're obviously missing axes, names, and things like that. So there's more work that needs to be done there. Just want to give you an idea of kind of the procedure that um, I would go through to do this linear regression analysis. Okay, so it does appear like there's something going on. There's this weird little cloud down here, but other than that, it does appear like income is um, correlated. And it's important on this one that we do give the axis a name because we're gonna lose track of it. It's spending 2021. So let me go in here and go to that primary and call this spending. And I would need to add income on the y-axis, change the chart name. So I'll do one for you. I don't have the time to do them all and I don't think it's appropriate. So income versus spending um, in 2021. Oops. All right, so we see what does appear to be a multicollinearity. Um, all right, so now let's go and do the next one. So now we've got percent change in spending of 2021. So we're gonna do um, spending 2021 and percent change. And I'm just gonna keep working on that. And boy, is that strongly correlated, isn't it? So let's put that one in here. Okay. Okay, so percent change and And this was percent change, and this was the next one down, and this was uh, spending 2021. Okay, and let's go ahead and put that trend line in. All right, that linear trend line. And again, um, I haven't, got, I'm not going to take the time in this video to go in and make my trend lines like red or something that's easier to see, but that would certainly be expected um, to make them pop out. Or maybe I shouldn't say expected, that might sound too strong. That would be uh, desirable. Okay, all right. So now let's look at the natural log of income and spending 2021. Okay, so we have this possible other correlation going on here. Uh, all right. So that's so me, and I'm just gonna. I'm holding the control key down to unselect it, and then I'm gonna select the natural log of income. And again, do a scatter plot. over here, put this one here. Oops, I messed up. And I gotta go get it again, shoot. It's gonna let me out, there it is. Okay.
So again, this is the third one, and it's a natural log of income and spending 2021. All righty, and um, I have two more to do. I'm just going to pause the video and finish. Okay, so now I finished looking at all these potential uh, correlations between my predictors, the one in orange here. I wanted to make sure um, I understood if I possibly had multicollinearity. And here are the graphs that I made. I wanted to point out that I'm not surprised, right? And if we look at income and the mathematical transformation of income, which is just the natural log of income, that we just see the natural log curve showing up. So that's all that's going on there. Um, the rest of them are actual, you know, one's not derived from the other. So th that one's by far the most um, directly connected. We'd want to not put both of them in the model. So um, I think what we can do is start out by... Um, writing what the possible predictors are. And um, I, because of the multicollinearity, what I want to do is go ahead and put all the ones that I think look somewhat similar here. So we have income and um, we have percent change. seems to be, they're correlated with spending in 2021. And um, so income and spending 2021 and spending 2021 and percent change. And um, question is what about percent change and spending, what about income and percent? change. So income and percent change is over here at 0.71. So yeah, those are all um, appear very uh, inter interchangeable in some sense. And the natural log of income is as well with spending 2021 and, and income. And I think we could still run one more, which we didn't, but I think it would come out the same. And that is the percent change at 0.69. A little on the low side, but I think we would probably um, understand that it's in here and it's probably fine. So, um, income percent change, spending 2021, and um, the natural log of income. All right, so we're seeing a connection between all of these. And so let me just go ahead and put a little box around these. And I'm going to say, I'm going to, in this box right here, I'm going to merge all these. So I'm just going to merge these cells and I'm going to say one of. So we can't use all of them because they're possibly collinear. So we need to pick one of those. And then um, in addition to one of those, we saw spending 2020 is not, does not appear correlated with any of these. So that means spending 2020 can go in as its own predictor. So we'll add that one here. Okay. Now, when we consider what we want to use for um, these four, it's really, this is, we're going to eventually, once we figure out our model, want to not, um, we don't want to, um, we're not, I mean, sorry, we're going to enter, we're going to swap them out and try them all to see which one's the best fitting uh, for our data. For, for the model. So um, we can choose between these and um, spending 2021 in 
maybe what you're thinking, wow, that seems like it would be nice to know spending 2021 was predictive of satisfaction. So um, the reason I am leaning away from it is because we are making a whole argument <laughs> that satisfaction has already been shown through one of the hypothesis tests I did in class as an example, that um, the gold members had a higher rating of very satisfied and that um, in spending um, their gold members because they're, they have higher levels of spending in 2021. So therefore I feel like that's kind of a circular argument in some sense. Um, I'd rather pick a different one so I can look at percent change between 20 and 21 or income. So I think I'm going to just go with income. Um, I feel like income might be more useful to um, Catherine Hill. So let me just go ahead and select that one is where I'm going to start. And I'll just say that's my initial choice. All right. The spending 2021. Let's just say uh, we're going to um, not use this one uh, for um, question two. And this is only true for uh, mine. Well, I mean, that's for class project. Not true for your problem. Okay, you might be able to use it. Um, in fact, a lot of you, it's your response variable. So again, you know, you, you, if it's a response variable and it's highly correlated, that's great, but we don't want to use it as a predictor. Okay, so now we've gotten out of this, we've got basically two. We've got this one and we have spending 2020. So let me go ahead and put that one in yellow. Okay. All right, so now that we've figured out some numerical predictors, um, let's go in and try and figure out um, what we want to use for our uh, categorical predictors. Okay, so for that, we are going to um, create, we're going to take each one of the categorical variables and we're going to create a very specific type of uh, contingency table of sorts. Okay. So the way that it's going to look, so we're going to check. So here's where we're going to check or look for, maybe is a better way to put it, look for categorical predictors. So in order to do that, we're going to need a pivot table. So I'm going to go ahead and add a pivot table here. I'm going to use all the data from ARDS full. And um, so that I kind of really can choose anything I want. So I'm going to go from B1 over here. And um, I'm going to come all the way down to SAT score because that score is the one that I really care about. So I'm going to select this big rectangle of data and I'm going to insert a pivot table and I'm going to tell it where I want it. I want it over here in the Q2 EDA. And I'm going to scroll down below my grass and I'm going to put it here. Okay. So now I have my pivot table here to look at. And basically I'm going to start at the top of the list and go through one at a time, each one of my categorical variables. So I'm gonna start with sex and I'm gonna put it in the rows. And this is the very specific columns that I wanted you to show you. I'm gonna take whatever my response variable. So for you, it might be spending 2021. It might be number of orders. It might be days since last. Whatever your response variable is, you're going to put it in the values Okay, and we don't want the sum. What we want is the average. So we're going to go in here and change this to the average. Okay, now in the average, um, remember this is kind of like your sandbox where you're going to be working. So we're going to 
move things out of here. So this is the first one we're going to copy and move that out. So let me copy that and I'm going to paste special. Okay, and um, I'll just say this is sex here. And, you know, you can figure out how you want to format it nicely. Um, yeah. and once you've formatted one of them, then you can use your paintbrush um, to format a lot of the other ones. So uh, I'm just going to go to two decimals. I feel like that's appropriate. Okay. So what I'm looking for here is do one of these numbers are one of these numbers very different from the other? And which that means that that particular category of that categorical variable could be a predictor. So these look very close. And if I wanted to, I could also insert here a, um, a bar chart of sorts. Okay. So these look like um, we got the average SAT score, but notice that the y-axis is not starting at zero. And this is one of those things we talked about distorting what you're looking at. So let's actually make that bottom go start at zero so we can really see if this is a legit difference. Okay, so if we look at it on a scale from zero, we realize there really aren't, there isn't really that much of a difference here between these. Okay. And um, I'm going to go ahead and do that with each one of these categoricals. So I'm going back to the pivot table. And um, let me close that out. Okay. I'm going to move my graph. Oops, not the, not the title of the graph. I'm going to move down my graph a little bit so that I don't overwrite anything with my pivot table. So going back to the pivot table, um, I leave the right hand side alone. And I'm just going to drag sex back. And I'm going to now go to the next variable. So I have race and um, reduced race. There's one person who made a hypothesis about agents. They have to use race. Otherwise, I think we can, for most people, you can use reduced race. OK, so once again, um, I simply create now for my variable SAT score, the average SAT scores in here, I'm going to copy these down. And I don't even really need that grand total. I could leave that off. So let me just copy this. And over here, I'm going to just delete this part, clear the content of that. All right. And um, I can paste this, call this race. I think I can, I think it's gonna let me do this. Paste that, paste to the last two lines on this. All right, and then take this middle one and paste that to this one that was not there. So that's how I use the formatting from a, row, a table with two rows for a table with four rows. All right, and then I just want to do a similar kind of graph. So I'm going to go in here and insert, and I'm going to get my chart. I actually like um, when I select the chart to go to select change chart type. It gives me this nice colorful option. I just, I like that one better. That doesn't really, really matter. But I don't know, it makes it pop to me a little. All right. So once again, we have this horrible problem on the axis. Let me see if I can get the axis selected from that axis. So the zero. Let's make sure we're not zooming in on something, creating an artificial impression when it, there isn't really anything there. All right. So, so far for the satisfaction score, I'm not seeing a difference between male and female as a to use either as a predictor, not really seeing very much in race. Okay, so just to give you an idea, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Over here, maybe I would say observations. And again, this is a little bit, um, well, I shouldn't say again. There are several of you who I told, think of this a little bit like a scavenger hunt. So 
So we're trying to find if there's something that we might want to use as a predictor. Um, so I would say no difference by sex. Um, it looks like there's no difference by race. So let's go ahead and keep going here. I'm going to work on these and pause the video and come back when I've completed them. Okay, so now I took every single one of the categorical variables one at a time and put them in this and created a tables so I can see um, what, um, since I wanna start with a full model, I wanna, maybe pick one so to just possibly eliminate. So here I look at sex, female and male. I see no difference by sex, but I see a little bit more in female. So we're gonna go ahead and put that one in a bit more for female. So go ahead and set that up, okay. Um, now if we look at race, it, they're, they are very close together, just like the SAT scores for female and female, but maybe it's a little bit higher. If you look, um, these there's two at 3.7, one at 3.8, and then 3.9. It's on the higher side, so possibly a bit more satisfied if they're Hispanic. And then um, I'm gonna look at college, and those are really close together. The only ones that don't matter are the unknowns, but if you go back and you look at your EDA, for um, your uh, frequency for college, there was very, very few that were unknown. So there's, you, you don't want to run anything that has like a sample size of three. You, that definitely would not help you. That's just probably random, totally random there. Okay, and then we get down to channel. That was the last one to look at. Um, and I noticed that if I uh, kind of think of what is the general trend? It looks like the um, customers, um, sorry, I meant to say customers acquired by S standard mailer are less satisfied. Because they're at 3.5 here in the gray chart. Um, so we're gonna use that one, okay? Um, as far as um, college goes, I think we're gonna just have to leave that one off. I don't really see how that could be a predictor in any way, um, I don't see anything standing out there. All right, so that means we're going to use, and we're going to go ahead and name these as what their dummy variable name would be. So some of these I think we already added to the data and others we might still have to add. So here we're gonna have the variable female. So um, let me um, do it this way. Okay, so this is what we observe. So let's go over here to our Q2 EDA, and we are going to go up to these observations where we are finding our predictors here. And we're just gonna keep track of them. So we're gonna have female. This is again, the full model. Some of these may drop out. What if they're not, if the p-values for them are not significant. Um, and remember the modeling, uh, the modeling uh, strategy is we start with the full model and drop the highest p-value that's not significant. And then we rerun the reduced model and we keep doing that until all the p-value, um, until all the p-values are not, are significant, less than 0.05, and, or we use the um, regression statistics to select between our models. And you wanna maybe, narrow it down to maybe two or three. You're gonna use the top three uh, model choices in your tech report. You're gonna put them in there, you're gonna fill out that table. And that's the table that we talk about in here. Um, so we wanna fill out this table for our top three models. So I should have been looking at this actually. So we created the category, okay, you don't have to do that. So all of this is, does not apply to anyone but me, okay? Um, then we're going to start out here. Um, any predictors found in the EDA are indicative of correlation. We'll be using the initial full model. 
Um, we're going to identify the collinear ones, so we're doing that, and they're going to be swapped out later. Um, and we are going to um, include these ones that we found from that categorical. So let's go back to where we're listing them. So we're going to have female. We're going to use Hispanic. As we see, possibly there's a, a connection there. And um, no difference in college, really, that I can see to use. And then um, standard mailer seems to be a little bit different. It might be negatively correlated. So we'll, use, we'll say SM. All right. Now that we've done that, what we need to do is make sure we have all these variables, these dummy variables. So these are going to be dummy variables in the data. So I'm going to come back over to R, it's full. And um, I'm going to scroll to the right where we put these. So we have female in here, so that's good. Um, and we have SM, so that one's, we got female and SM, so we got two of them. And then the only one that's missing is Hispanic. So we need to create a dummy variable for Hispanic. Okay, so let's go in here and I'm gonna call this one Hispanic. Oops. So this is just equals if, and let's come over to the cell that has the, the reduced race in it. Oh, it wasn't that far, it was right next to me. There it is. If that equals Hispanic, gotta spell it right. Okay. Then this is a one, otherwise it's a zero. Very good. Right, black is not Hispanic, it's a zero, that's right. And let's double check, Hispanic is, should be a one, yep. Okay, so we've added those variables. Um, okay, so now that we've done all that, um, I think what we wanna do now is create our data that we're gonna use for our regression analysis. So let's go over here, we're gonna add another worksheet. So the linear regressions have more worksheets um, than the hypothesis test. We're going to call this Q2 regression data. Okay. So first thing I always want to do in my, um, when I'm creating my regression data is I want to put my response variable as the first column. So for me, it's SAT score. For you, it might be spending 2021, number of orders, whatever your response variable is. So I'm going to copy it. Um, just like we did before, I'm going to paste special on that one. Okay. Then the next thing I want to do is I want to get all the variables that I've identified that I want to include in my predictor as my full model. So the full model is going to have, and I can come over here maybe, and we can look at it go back there to where we put our little table. We're going to want income. So let's go and get income. Okay, so we got an income in here. And let's see, the next one that we're going to want is spending 2020. Spending 2020, let's grab that. And let's see, what other predictors should we find? So we're going to have female, Hispanic, and SM. Okay, so let's go and get female. Um, Hispanic and SM, it doesn't matter the order. I'm going to, SM's right here, so I'm going to grab it. And um, Hispanic. And again, yours may be totally different, okay? So don't just copy me. You have to follow the logic of my example, not copy it word for word, because it that will very likely take you down the wrong path. Okay, I'm just giving you an example and you have to turn on your brain and apply what I'm doing in an anal analogous fashion in your data. 
Okay. So. Let's um, go ahead and then format everything across the top. And I'm just going to go ahead and align these in the center. All right. So now that we've gotten all that in, all that data, um, now you're going to start building your model. And I am going to stop here because I have already shown you in class several times and in movies how to build a linear regression model, okay? What I do wanna remind you is that we want to start with a full model and then begin to um, think about how to improve the fit by removing un unsignificant predictors is one guide, looking at the adjusted R squared to decide between models, and also possibly looking at um, the standard error of the estimate. Um, one thing though, once I'm all is said and done, and I think I have my model, if the final model contains income, I then want to run another model with percent change and another model with a natural log of income, and I want to compare it because I wanna see if percent change or natural log of income may not be a little bit better predictors of satisfaction. Um, so for me, if you have multicollinearity in these, and you probably will, um, you, you can go ahead and swap out uh, spending 2021 if that's not your response variable. Um, as well. I just can't. The reason I can't is because it's directly tied to my satisfaction score, because that's kind of how I created the satisfaction score. I'm sorry, because we, we ran a hypothesis test and I, and I know they're connected already. So I don't want to have a circular argument. Okay, hopefully that makes sense about my special case. All right. So, um, now that I have that, I would add yet another tab, and I would call this um, the Q2 regression. And this is where I would start um, putting in my models that I build off my regression data. Now remember, as I run different models, I may have to create over here to the right rectangles of the data that I'm going to actually use in my model. So you may end up making copies. Like let's say I want to run a model with income and female. Well, if I want to run a model where income and female are my predictors, I'm going to, um, I can leave, always leave the response variable where it is, but maybe I would just make a copy of what I want my data for my model to be. Uh, and I can just have my little rectangle of data for that model over here so that then I can use that in the regression program in Excel. Okay, I hope that helps um, with how you would do those problems. Now, when we get over to the Mills data, we're gonna follow along in the exact same way that I did for Q1 in order to do the Q1 hypothesis test, I mean, Q3 hypothesis test, we just do this analogous type of um, activities to arrive at the Q3 analysis. And then similarly, uh, like I did for Q2 with the linear regression, you're gonna do a similar type thing for um, the um, Q4 regression, okay? You're just gonna be working on a different data set, okay? So hopefully that is giving you um, some guidance on how to do this. I am going to sort of quietly continue with my regression um, analysis and make some comments as I go. So I'm going to come in here now and I'm going to um, I'm going to run in here and um, let's actually go and get our question too. Variables. 
in the data. Predictive. Of a higher satisfaction rating. So we're going to start out with the full model. So um, let's go. I am going to go to where the data is. And this was just an example. I don't know, you know, what your data is going to be like. Your predictors will be totally, possibly very different than mine. Again, I am just giving you an example for my question. It's very, very specific to my question. You really do need to um, understand how it's an analogy and not a me doing it for you. So, you know, you want to do your own work here. So let me go in here. I'm going to go to data. Okay, so I'm looking at the p-values and I see that the one that is the worst is this one. So this would be my first choice to drop. It's not significant. Okay. So now I'm going to run another model where I drop Hispanic from the model. And um, I'll call this model too. Okay. If you get the invisible window, just either wait or close it and reopen it, usually that works. Okay, remember the response variable should be fine where it is. It is the um, rectangle of predictor data that usually has to be changed. Since I'm dropping Hispanic, um, I see that's column up. I'm just going to change this to an E. Do that a little quicker. And then I got to change my location of my output. This is all just repeated data. That's why I'm just getting rid of it. I wish that they changed the regression in Excel. They used to do that. So, sort of it. be nice if you had the option to not get that. All right. So now I'm looking at the first thing is okay, it's a little significant. Let's look at these p values. Okay. Um, so we see in these p values that we have two that are not that are significant and we have two that are not. So now the highest one is this one. 
and that applies to female. So looks like female does is not a significant predictor. So that's the one we're going to drop next. That I'm going to drop next. So over here, let's see, side by side, how we get there. So I'm going to go to the compression data. All right, so I need to have data that does not have female in it. So I'm going to just grab this column of data and I'm going to move it out. And I already have a copy of it over here, actually. But let's say you probably would not. So you just move it out. I wouldn't totally delete it. You might end up needing it for something else. So I would just make a copy over here of that. And then, and then just delete the, the empty column. Okay. Now, because I my um, responder response variable column is still the same, my rectangle of data is is actually automatically going to be okay because it's going out to E. Uh, oh no, actually, I need this to not include Hispanic, we already dropped Hispanic. So now we're gonna drop um, that. I need to make this a D. So I, we only want income, spending 2020, and SM in our model. And again, we gotta pick a new location to put that. So that's model two, I'm gonna put it Model three. I have space before I would. That's okay. Let's look at model three now. Okay. Right, let's look at those p values, and it looks like income and spending. 2020 are good, but we have, still have a problem with this um, standard mailer does not look significant. So this is going to be the one that we drop next. Okay, now let's just look at how we're doing um, in our standard error. Um, it is not coming down very much. The adjusted R squared is um, 0.09 uh, or 0.1 in there, and this is 0 0.1015 here. So it is getting a little bit better now. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, run model four. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to run another vertical line here. Um, <clears throat> just keep that separate, okay? And I'm um, going to put in model four. So for model four, I am dropping SM. So let's go look at our data. And SM is um, on the end of our data, so to speak. So all we want to do is try income and spending 2020. All right. So again, we're going to go through. Let's try that again. There we go. And now it's um, A is still the response variable, but now we just want B and C. So I'm going to make that a C. Okay. And then my output range is going to come, and I'm going to put that here. And so now we're all set there. 
So let me come in again. And again, old, right? But it's sort of interesting. This is how, this is the process on how we kind of start um, kind of arriving at a, a good fitting model. Okay, let's make this a little bit bigger so we can actually read it. Now we have, um, this is still significant. We expected that. And that p-values on our coefficients are significant. Now, what we should also confirm is that the adjusted R squared um, may have gone up. Nope, it went down a little. But our stand and our standard error um, also went up, went up. So they kind of went a little bit in the opposite direction, but that's okay. Um, we have a little bit um, better. We have more significant coefficients that we're including right now in our model. I mean, all significant. So that's the approach we've taken. There's more than one strategy for building a model, and some people would argue that if you have a good logical reason for keeping a predictor in, even if it's not significant, that you should go ahead and do that. So again, um, the this is um, science meets art, and that's sort of the art of it in some sense. But I want to start out trying to keep the art out as much as possible. So just want to start out, our strategy is to get down to significant predictors. All right, so now in some sense, this is our preferred model. So for me, for this is my preferred model. So I have some predictors that I can use to, um, uh, in, that are all significant and this is looking pretty good, but I'm not quite done yet because I want to go back to my um, EVA and I want to look at those swap out ones. So I use the income right now, and I want to swap in percent change and the natural log of income and see if my model improves, okay? So I'm going to go back to my regression data, and I'm going to take the place where income is, and I'm going to replace it with percent change. I'm swapping out that data. Let's go in here. Um, I actually still need to go get that data, it looks like. So let me, let me go over here and get it over here. So let me get that percent change data in here. I think if I click right here, it might let me put it in. Yeah, insert copy cells. All right, so we have percent change in spending 2020. Let's remind ourselves what the last model was at. So we want to keep those. Um, I can just move income out of the way. I already put a copy of it over here, so I could technically just delete it, but I'm just gonna leave it in for right now. Well, I'll delete it actually. So now I can run a regression model using percent change instead of income, because again, just to be really clear, these are collinear. So we can't use them both. We have to take turns using one or the other. So right now I'm looking at the relationship with percent change in income. And I'm gonna try to see if percent change fits my data a little better or not. So let's run, um, this is going to be model five. And sometimes in the real world, people will run hundreds of models if not even thousands. So what I'm hoping for you guys is that you're not gonna get past five or six. All right, let's see. So our response variable is still column A and our input um, is B and C. So because we swapped out the data, it's fine, everything looks good. 
The only problem is we got to delete the location and put that we want that output here. Okay. So now let's go see what we got from this one. Yeah, I keep forgetting to check. I'm just curious. Am I going too fast? Yeah, there's nothing to uncheck here. So it's kind of annoying. I won't uh, let me uncheck it. So I just got to manually get rid of it. It's just repeat information. That's the option if I want to try like 90% upper and lower. Okay. All right, so this is significant. Even with the swapped out variable, the p values are significant with the swapped out variable. All right, so comparing these two, um, let's, I'm just going to make this bigger so we can compare. Actually, we can compare them side by side here. Because over here, I want to compare to model four. So model four was my preferred model as of right now. And I want to compare the adjusted R squared. So right now, model four still beats out model five on the adjusted R squared. So let me uh, go ahead and color that one. And what about in the standard error? It's, it's 0.9842 and this is 0.9865. So we want that to go down. So this one's also the winner. So it looks like model four beat out model five. So income worked as a better predictor than percent change, okay? So now we're gonna go in and look at um, the next swap out. So now instead of percent change, we're gonna try the natural log of income and see if that improves the fit at all. Okay, sometimes when we have a, a numerical variable, the, the natural log of it can sometimes fit our data better. So let's try it. Okay. So we don't have that data in here either. I should have grabbed all that to begin with. So let me go ahead and grab that data now. And it's going to go in place of percent change, right? So copy that. Come over here and select C and it can start to copy cells. And then B, I'm going to actually move that over here so it's not lost and gone forever. So now we have, we're going to do income and spending 2020 as our predictors. We're not including these. These are left out, right? They haven't been included since a few models ago. So let's go ahead and run the regression on this. So when I start seeing the invisible box, I start thinking, oh, I think I'm starting to push the buffer memory in my uh, wimpy little laptop. And so I may have to be careful here. So as soon as I get this done, I'm going to uh, save. So we should be frequently saving. Okay, All right, so let's go check. We got the regression response variable in column A, and we're going B and C for the rectangle output. And we just gotta change this part. Okay. So let's go back out over to the models. Let's try to do that, okay? So let me up at the line in later. All right. Let's put that line in. And we'll call this model six.
save. Okay. In case we don't want our stuff. Sometimes Excel can get corrupted. That, and that's another reason why a lot of people use R. Or, um, R is like the gold standard, but there are other software packages. Okay, software languages. I'm going to delete this once again. Right, and I'm going to make this wider once again. Okay, and I'm going to once again just make sure that looks good. And I'm going to look at my p values, and they both look good. So, we're good to go on model six, but we want to compare model six with model four, which model four still remains our preferred model. Okay. So, just to make the comparison easy and look, look over here on, on my second window. Okay, so let's start out with the adjusted R squared. So, this is 0 0.0911. And this is 0 0.099. So this is model four is still better than putting in the natural log of income. And for the standard error, uh, we have 0.9889, you know, 789, all of that starts pushing this to being pretty much pretty high standard error. Um, this one is lower. So again, model four has now one from all the collinear parts. So in many ways, model four has become our candidate for the final model. So if you are stopping at this point, then um, you are, uh, You can stop at this point, or we can look for an interaction term. So I'm going to go ahead and look at for an interaction between income and spending, and seeing if they're, oops, if they possibly have an uh, an interaction. And like I told you in class, if you run interactions in your regression analysis, uh, it will be extra credit uh, if you even if you try it. You know, and whether you include it or not is the right is the right choice. Okay, so I'm going to run it and see what happens. So I'm going to come up with the regression data, and I'm going to replace the natural log of income with income because that was model four. So I'm going to come up here and insert the copy the cut cells, and then I'm going to take this, and I'm going to cut this, and put it over here. So now we have income and spending, and um, I'm going to add just to keep everything kind of separate, that we're going to need the interaction term. So you could say income um, spending 2020. Well, I just don't want a giant log variable. So that's what I'm doing. So, so this is going to equal the income times the spending 2020. And when you get all hash marks, that just means your column isn't wide enough. So you can just click up here. Okay, so we're going to calculate this for all our data. All right, so now we've added this interaction term to our data. I'm going to come over here and cut. let's see how model seven looks. It's model seven. This is the interaction model. So run that. You know what? I'm going to save. Right, now I'm going to run it. All right. So now we need the same response variable, but now the predictor rectangle of data should be B, C, and D. So again, I'm just going to make that a D. And 
And then the only other thing is This is looking good. P values are now up. None of them are significant. So this is uh, does not look like interaction is something that improved our model in any way. And we can come over here and compare the regression fit coefficients for our models. So. This is uh, model seven is 0.097, and this is 0.09, actually 0.1, if you round up, 0 0.10. So the adjusted R squared is still better in model four, and the standard error is 0.986, and this is 0.984. So the standard error is a little smaller here. So once again, model four wins, and uh, especially because all our um, coefficients became uh, not significant. All the p-values are greater than 0.05. So we can't trust that these actual coefficients are different from zero. All right, so we're going to trust these a little bit better over here. Okay, so given this, I'm going to select this as my preferred model. I'm going to go to the home screen and I'm going to put a um, thick outside border and I'm going to come up here and call this my preferred model. And what I'm going to want to do in my tech report is fill out that table that's in my analysis plan. So I'm going to pick my top three models and fill out this information in here. And one of those top three models will be model four. So you guys can decide. I'll let you figure out for yourself how what would be your um, models that are your top contenders next besides model four, which came the closest. Um, and you don't have to do it for my data, but on your own, I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to skip that part. Um, okay. So now that we've done this, we want to go ahead and run some residual plots to make sure that this um, model is not violating any of the assumptions. Okay, so now that we've done that, I'm going to add another um, sheet here. I'm going to rename this one uh, the Q2 residuals. So let's go ahead and run that. So let's go back to that regression data. And um, remember, our final model is income and spending. We don't want to include the interaction term. So I'm just going to insert, just to remind me that I just want eight. I want columns B and C. All right, so I'm actually rerunning the regression model. And I'm going to. Um, so I already, I already ran this one, but now I'm going to run it again. And I'm going to run it. With the plots. So let me get this out. Get everything there. I'm going to put it in here. And now I'm going to come down here and choose the residual plots and the line fit plots and the normal probability plots. Okay. All right, so put all that there. Let's look at what we got. So this is residual plots. Okay. 
your Q2 final model. Now, if I couldn't decide between my last two models, I would maybe run residual plots on each one and see what, what um, I'm seeing in the data that may be um, helpful. Now, we've already seen all this information here on the regression model um, results. So some of this we don't have to re revisit, we've already done it. Okay, but what we wanna do is we're going to, oops. We're gonna start out by checking out our residual plots. So I'm gonna be looking at both my residual plots. So I'm gonna start looking at my income versus residual. So income, all my income is on the x-axis and my residuals are on the y-axis. Okay, so if I look at this, it looks to me um, like a good residual plot. I don't see an overall trend. I might be seeing just a little bit of changing variability. It's possible um, that you could imagine that this is shrinking down a little. And remember, we wanted a, a band that stays the same width. So um, what I told you is that changing variability means that the standard errors are maybe not reliable um, or in our regression model. And if that's the case, we may not be able to trust the p-values, but the correction for that is beyond the scope of Excel. So we're going to notice that, but that will not be um, something that we are going to be able to take into consideration. Okay, now if we look at this other one, um, the spending um, 2020 residual plot, we see that that does look like it has uh, more of a, uh, equal spreading in our variability as we go across. Okay. What Excel does not do for us is a similar plot using the, um, the actual predicted values and the residuals. So for that, we have the predicted SAT scores here and the residuals here. So that one is, um, we can just basically select this data. And go to insert, scatter plot. Okay. So part of what we're seeing here is coming from the modeling. So let me see, I'm just gonna cut it. And we're gonna add it up here. So this is the <clears throat> predicted that scores residual plot. And this one's a little bit weird. Um, part of what we're seeing is because our satisfaction scores were um, actually category scores, one, two, three, four, five. So if you're doing um, number of order, no, that shouldn't, I don't know. I don't think you're gonna have this issue. So this is an artifact of that I took categorical data and actually created this category scores. And so I'm seeing this kind of weird behavior, but I think it's okay, all right? So it's a little bit weird, but it's, it's the reason I say it's okay is because I'm kind of seeing roughly the same amount above and below. So it's, even though we're seeing these diagonal stripes, I think it's kind of okay. This is like not great, but it's okay. The line fit plots um, are basically the um, 
the line fit plots are helpful for um, kind of seeing if you were to fix for the income, like if you were to fix spending, how close are your points to your predicted points? So this is looking pretty far off. So I think we, I think our data just isn't doing a great job um, identifying things that can be really used to identify satisfaction. So um, we're, we're seeing that the, we're, we're not too lined up. Or we would love to see the, the blue and orange triangles be more on top of each other. So this is not the greatest model. I really knew it wasn't such a great model because the R squared is so low. Remember the R squared is the um, amount of variability that's predicted by our model. And we're at like 11%. We really like that up in the high 80s or 90s. So this model in general is not a great model. And I'm not totally surprised because of that category score thing I had to do to it. So um, I think your models will fit much better. Okay, um, all right, so now that we've done that, let's go back and look at the, uh, the rest of the analysis plan. So we have determined that we're okay with the residual plots, they look okay. Oh, the one thing we forgot was the normal probability of the residuals. All right, so this I did in one of the movies. Um, and um, we're going to copy the residuals over. And paste those special. And then I'm going to uh, select just these. I'm going to, the second copy I'm going to order. I can actually get them here. Go to the data and sort it. And yes, we only want to sort that column, not the rest of the table. And we do want to go from smallest to largest. Okay, and so now we can Go ahead and can I pick it maybe? Yeah, let me do that. So we have some issues in this model because what we want is that our residuals be normally distributed. And what the normal probability plot, plot is, so this is a normal probability plot on the residuals. So one of our assumptions is that our residuals are normally distributed with a mean of zero. And if that's the case, um, they need to line up. They need to be on a line or close to a line. So you can see that this trend line here um, doesn't look that um, I mean, you can see that the, the dots don't look too much like they're on a line. They, they're sort of a line in the middle, and they kind of really kind of get off the line on the ends. So Again, you would want to write about that, um, that we have some issues in, in this model. So I'm not loving this model. I would not really like to use it to make a lot of business decisions with, but I wanted to go through the steps. And this might be, some of you may encounter better models and some of you may encounter worse models. So I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> okay. But we are going to proceed as this is our best model. We are going to use that model, um, our preferred model, to make um, predictions. And we're going to put a confidence interval around the predictions and a prediction interval around them. Okay, 
So we want to make a 95% confidence interval for the average spending in 2021. Oh. I did not need to have that in there. So I need to fix this. So we went, um, so for my model, I want a 95 confidence interval for the average satisfaction score. Um, of all OFS customers who meet um, the values of the predictors and so so what we're going to do is um, both of our predictors are numerical, income and spending. So what we are going to do is we're going to provide, we're going to use the two quartiles for income and spending, um, Q1 and Q3 values, and we'll run those in the model with um, whatever the Q1 and the Q3 values are for income and spending. And for each of those, we're going to put a confidence interval around that estimate for those and for the, and a prediction interval for the individual average satisfaction score. So let's go ahead and set that up. So let's call this now. We're going to add now another tab, and it's going to be called Q2 predictions. Okay. So let's go ahead and get our preferred model coefficients. So this is what we're going to need to use. This is really, once we've Everything else is just used to find the model, test the model, all that. But once we're all is said and done, it's the coefficients that we're going to actually care about. So we're going to grab those. All right. So this is going to be our Q2 predictions. Oops, let me go back and get them again, I think. Okay, and now we are going to say um, we're going to we're going to just do two. So I'll call this the uh, the low low values and then the high values. Of the predictors. So if you have a combination of dummy variables and predictors, you're going to, you can just use zeros for the low values and ones for the high values on your um, dummy variables. But for the low and high values for your predictors that are numerical, and mine are both numerical, we're gonna need to get the actual um, summary statistics on those so that we can obtain those quartiles. So let me pause and go open that. Okay, so now I went back and I got my task two um, Excel work. And I'm looking now at the two um, predictors that I'm using in my model, income and spending 2020. So for the low values for income, um, I'm going to come here and I'm going to use the uh, Q1, the first quartile's value for income. So I'm going to copy that into here. That's the low value. And for the, um, let me just shrink this up a little and move it over. Okay. So for um, spending 2020, the Q1 is is the 739.89. So I'll copy that over. So I'm using the quartiles one for the low values and I'm going to use quartile three for the high values. So I'll put that in here. 
Oops, I got the wrong one somehow. That's weird. I think my Excel is getting tired. Uh, let me just put the, maybe I need to make sure this is doing this right. Okay. I think I forgot when I got the uh, spending 2020 low value, spending 2020 low value. I'm going to copy that. I need to copy over the um, value, not the formula. Okay. And this actually, I should make sure I copy this and not. Let's copy the, let's not connect, let's not link up into other spreadsheets. Okay, so these are, and so the only one left, right, is, um, by the way, I got rid of that little thing by hitting escape. Okay, so now I need the, for spending 2020, the high value, so I'm going to get the Q3 um, quartile here. I'm going to copy that and paste special. All right. So now I've gotten that, and we always want to put one as the coefficient. So these are going to be our point estimates. I'm going to format this. Actually, these were with less money. All right. So let's get these point estimates. And this is going to be um, a satisfaction score that's being estimated. So we're going to say equal sum product. And we're going to use these coefficients times these predictor variable values. And we get a 3.45. And we'll go back and convert that back to English when we're all said and done. And I want to use the same formula, but the, this blue box as an absolute reference. So I'm going to put the dollar signs on it and copy it over. Um, to this value right here. Okay, so um, the low values, we're looking at 3.45 um, for income and spending, and uh, satisfaction score is predicted as 4.02 or 4.03 for income and spending um, being the third quartiles of all their values. Okay. Now, these are just the point estimates. We have to put the confidence intervals around these point estimates, okay? And we're gonna get the 95% confidence interval uh, around each of these point estimates. All right, so let's go ahead and start setting that up. So um, we're gonna need to create new data for each one of those point estimates. So um, for the first one, we're gonna have income um, and it's going to be um, this amount right here. So let's copy that over. And we are going to have spending 2020. And it's going to be this low number, the, the Q1, the, the first quartile value for spending 2020, which was this number. Okay, and what we're going to do is get the data that we use for this. And let's go ahead and copy the, um, the response variable over. So we're going to copy this response variable over. And I'll just put it right here. And now I'm going to create what is a modified version of the income data. So we'll call this income star because it's so I could even say income low. So I'll be doing the lower values. And this is spending 2020 on the low side, spending 20 low. 
So um, I'm going to take whatever my income is. Let me come back over here. So I'm going to say this is going to equal my income. And I'm going to subtract from it the value that I want to put the confidence interval around that is the predictors that gave me the point estimate. So those are the Q1, so I'm gonna put that one in there. And um, I want that first part to be a relative reference, but I want this to be subtracted from every single one of those values. So I'm gonna make that a function of four, absolute reference. And now I can just go ahead and run that down, okay? Um, actually, I can actually even copy this formula over um, if I change my dollar sign options and make the row fixed but not the column. So I'm going to hit function F4 and that way I can copy this formula over here. So let's make sure it worked. We are now pointing to column C, which is spending. And we are in row two. And we are subtracting H3. So that works. So we should be subtracting H3 from all of these. Let's just make sure, yep. Yeah. OK. So that works. So that's our spending low amount. And in order to put the um, prediction, confidence, and prediction interval around this. Um, and there's a video on doing all this. Um, so I'm going to stop here and um, we'll refer you to the um, video where I go through and once I have this new data that's been set up, the amounts of the predictors subtracted off and I rerun it, then I can put a I can use the result of that to create a 95% confidence interval around this um, 3.45 and also another one around 4.02. And then I can also do prediction intervals of an individual's satisfaction um, given their income and spending. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to show you how you'd set it up. You're gonna basically do the same thing um, and create more rows of data. So we can put that here if we want. And maybe this is the income high. Um, so um, you know, we could copy these two over here. And I'm just going to do paste transpose. And, all right, so we got those. And then we're just going to create the same thing. We would say income. I am spending and 2020 high. This is just going to be using these higher values here of these um, predictors. And we're going to do the same thing where we subtract off from what was in the original data. And then we're going to rerun the regression. And then we're going to use um, the results of that to help build the confidence interval. And that is all in the video on, on doing that um, in Brightspace. So let me just make sure I point you to the video where you would use, you, I don't want to make double videos of the same thing. So go to class videos. I already think <clears throat> there's already oh, probably too much repetition from other ones in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I believe it is the, um, linear regression 7.2 uh, model video. I'm almost positive uh, that you can, you know, quickly scan to make sure you find that it's one of these two videos. I'm pretty sure it's a 7.2 one. Okay, so um, that is how I would do Question two. So let's go back and look at the analysis plan and see if we've um, 
sort of um, completed it. In the tech report, I would want to write an interpretation of each of the coefficients, and I would want to write an interpretation of my confidence in my prediction intervals. Um, for me, this does not apply to you, but just in case you're curious, I would want to go back, and when I write about it, I would look and say, okay, my um, point estimate, right? So I'm gonna put a confidence interval around this, but I would want to interpret it in, back into plain English. So 3.45, I'd say um, that if the income and spending were in the lower end, um, like by the first quartile, it looks like the, the predicted satisfaction score comes out kind of between neutral and somewhat satisfied, right? That's kind of close to halfway between those. But if the income and the spending are in the higher at the third quartile level, we see that we're coming out really close to somewhat satisfied. So we are seeing some ability to predict satisfaction by this um, model, even though it's not a great model, as I told you. Okay, um, and that is everything that you need to know for the two types of problems, the hypothesis testing and the linear regression. And um, then you're gonna repeat that kind, every, all those kind of steps down here on questions three and question four. Okay, and then finally, um, you can also add in any additional analysis that you might wanna do.